A night of dancing leads to a mysterious disappearance. There was a needle in a haystack to find her. Then, a phone call brings an unexpected player to the investigation. I knew something was going to happen, but I wasn't quite sure what yet. These are the true stories of real cases and the psychics who help investigators solve their most baffling mysteries. Just south of San Francisco Bay is Santa Clara County, known for its little towns and fertile landscapes. One Sunday morning, in the small town of Gilroy, a young woman is reported missing. She had already been notified as a missing person by her family. The night before, 31-year-old single mother Norma Hofer left her four young children with her parents to go out dancing with her friends. She never came back. Two days later, her purse was found in an alley in San Jose. The details weren't adding up. At the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Department, detectives Carrie Cola and Michelle Sandry are assigned to the case. They have to work fast, as they know that time is against them. We want to always try to crack these cases within 72 hours to preserve evidence and keep people's minds attuned to what they have just seen or witnessed. So we went out to the Hoffer house and talked with the father. And he ran down what her routine is on that day. Detectives learned that Norma had gone to a popular bar in Gilroy that night to socialize with a few friends. Desperate for any clues, they decide to drive to Gilroy and visit the locations where Norma had last been seen. This was the focal point of the whole investigation, this bar, and uh, the group of people that were there with her. She all worked with them. Right. They all partied together. So being that it was a small community, all the answers were right there at the bar. At that point, when we made contact with the bar manager, she owned a home in Gilroy where a party had taken place that weekend, and she had heard that Norma had been at her party. Sensing this might be the break they need, police dispatch a forensic team to the bartender's house. In one of the bedrooms, they find a few tiny stains that look like blood. They also notice that the bedspread is missing. After canvassing the local area and speaking with dozens of witnesses, Detectives begin to piece together Norma's last evening. According to Norma's friends, the party went from the bar to the bartender's home. One of the guys at the party was Norma's ex-boyfriend. It immediately sent a cord to Michelle and I that, hey, there's where we have to start is most generally in missing person situations. It's somebody that really knows the victim. He focused our attention on this boyfriend. He tells them he had partied until dawn the night that Norma disappeared, and several witnesses support his alibi. These witnesses also tell detectives that Norma seemed much more interested in another man she'd met that night. 24-year-old Bobby Biggs, a laborer from nearby Morgan Hill. They find Biggs living nearby in his parents' home and bring him in for questioning. We escorted him back to our substation in, in the city of San Martin and interviewed him. As we started interviewing him, when did you last see him? we noticed that he had some scratches on an arm, and he had an abrasion on his hip. We asked him how he attained all these uh, blemishes to his body. He informed us that he had been helping his father pour cement at his father's residence, and then he got scrapes that were in the yard. The detectives have a hunch. There's something suspicious about the scratches and Biggs' nervous behavior. They decide to dig a little deeper. After questioning, we let Mr. Biggs go. We went back to his parents' residence. We talked to them about how Bobby might have gotten scratched. Did he help pour cement? that weekend with his father, and the father acknowledged that he did. 
and acknowledge that there were some rose bushes in, in the area where they poured some that. Biggs's alibi seems airtight, and investigators have run out of suspects. Days pass with no phone call, and no one has seen Norma's car. Now we felt we were entering a, a very bad situation for our missing person. She had every intention to go back home. She had left her phone number of where she was at with her, her father. But the investigation has stalled. Then, Cola receives an unexpected phone call. A paralegal in Los Angeles has questions about a different case. Sergeant Cola? My name is Danielle, and, I'm... and I said, Sergeant Cola, I'm calling you about the Smith case. And I started getting these really funny feelings. I started getting really cold and feeling goosebumps. Unbeknownst to Cola, Danielle Gordon is a psychic. I knew something was going to happen, but I wasn't quite sure what yet. Doniel's ability to provide uncanny information about murder cases has convinced even skeptical cops to pay attention to her visions. Law enforcement officers started listening to what I have to say, and as I helped one officer, they would tell another, and it would grow, and it became very easy for me to deal with law enforcement officers on that level. She just never knows when those visions will appear. I can be dealing with my children, or driving in the car, doing almost anything, and all of a sudden a feeling will come over me, and I will see or hear a crime being committed. And I can feel the person that's committing the crime. I can feel on the victim the fear, the anguish. Then. Donielle has a sudden vision of Norma Hofer. She said to me right out of the blue, you know, I think your lady's dead. And she has children, doesn't she? And he said, yes, she does. And I just kind of relaxed and I closed my eyes and I just started letting things happen. Whenever I've had a vision, or whenever I hear voices, it's always been when the other side wanted to show me. It's never been when I went looking. There was a party. She was strangled. And you've talked to the suspect. I feel like she's on kind of a hill. She's wrapped in a blanket. There's some houses a ways down from where you'll find her. Detective Cola, who'd never worked with a psychic before, wasn't sure what to make of the information coming from the stranger on the other end of the phone. If this uh, pans out, I'll, I'll get right back to you. When I hung up the phone, I said, wow, there's been no reporting of this case in Los Angeles. This lady's in Los Angeles. She has no knowledge of anything we're dealing with at this point. I was a little bit skeptical. I didn't discount it, but I mean, I, I wasn't going to take it to the bank either. Cola is perplexed by the psychic's clues and puts them out of his mind. Then, a background check reveals that Biggs had prior arrests for drug possession. They question his parents a second time, and his mother reveals a telling detail. She said usually when he committed a crime or did anything wrong, he ran. But she said, I don't think he did anything wrong because he's still here. You know, he didn't run. Biggs hadn't run yet, but the detectives wanted to make sure that he couldn't. We conferred with his parole officer, and we had his parole officer violate him put him in jail, just pending the outcome. Because everything's starting to now focus on Biggs' involvement. Meantime, results were back from the lab. They confirmed that the blood in the bedroom was Norma's blood type. It's now three days since she vanished, and the clock is ticking. We knew time was against us. We now suspicion that we had a, a foul play situation, more than likely a homicide. 
but quite frankly, we needed the body. They might have a suspect in custody, but without a body, they cannot charge him with any crime. They continue searching rural areas, looking for any sign of Norma or her car. Local authorities were overwhelmed, so they decide to bring in additional support. We solicited the aid of a helicopter. Because our South County area is very large, it's like 600 square miles, and it's very remote, very hilly. We couldn't possibly see, you know, a car or something out of place somewhere. The pilots search areas that correspond to the psychic's description, but turn up nothing. The detectives are becoming frustrated. Several times we just, you know, think, think, think. You know, where do you think she'd be? Do you think you'd dump her in the reservoir? Because there's two reservoirs over there. So we did drive around, drove around the different reservoirs. Gosh. Everywhere, everywhere, just everywhere. And as the investigators search, they keep in mind the description given to them by Donielle. I feel like she's on kind of a hill. There's some houses a ways down. You guys go up the top here? When we went way up out into the boonies, it's like, oh, there's no houses up here. What are we doing up here, Carrie? <laughs> there's no houses up here. You know, let's go down where there's houses and then maybe we'll find her around there. After four days of fruitless searching, the detectives are on the verge of giving up. Even with the psychic's clues, finding Norma Hofer is beginning to feel like Mission Impossible. What shocking discovery lies at the end of the psychic's clues when we return? Detectives Michelle Sandry and Carrie Cola have been searching rural Santa Clara County for several days, looking for the body of Norma Hofer. And they only have a psychic's clues to guide them. She was strangled. She's on kind of a hill. She's wrapped in a blanket. But will these clues be enough to lead them to the body? Gilroy is, it's a, it's a little town surrounded by a lot of farmland. It was a needle in a haystack to find her. Their main suspect, Bobby Biggs, is being detained on a parole violation. But unless they find Norma's body, they will have to release him. At that particular point, we started going back to Mr. Biggs's residence. As we're driving, it was wooded and bushy and had thickets and had a little road and it had just finished raining. As they approach the Biggs's home, Cola suddenly realizes that the area exactly matches the psychic's description. He asks his partner to make a sharp turn. I told Michelle, I said, you know what? Why don't we just drive down this little road and look in here? And I got out of my car and I started to put on a pair of rubber boots because it was muddy outside. And as I did, I was bending over, and I looked over to my left. Michelle, come here. And I just froze for a few moments, and then I said, Michelle, come here. I go over to him, and, and he, goes, he goes, no, I mean, he goes, I mean, down here. And he's pointing down to where he's putting on his galoshes. So I bend down, and I, he goes, now look. Does that look like a body to you? Sure enough, about 50 or 60 feet, there was a silhouette of a, what appeared to be a human being lying on its back with a blanket covering. And I'm looking, I'm going, I'll be damned. Cola, that's a body, and you know, it's gotta be Norma. It's gotta be Norma. It was Norma Hofer, strangled to death on a hillside with houses nearby and wrapped inside a blanket, just as the psychic had predicted. They have found the body, and they have a suspect in custody. But to build an airtight case against Biggs, they'll need more physical evidence tying him to the crime. In evaluating the evidence, detectives piece together Norma Hofer's last hours. 
They believe that Big strangled Norma in the bedroom, then wrapped her in the blanket to get rid of the body. On the way out of the room, he must have smashed her head against the dresser, causing the blood spatter. But what next? Investigators speculate he used Norma's missing car to get rid of her body. But they will have to prove it. And the only way they can do that is to find the car. It's anonymous. It sounds pretty credible. The car now became an important piece of evidence to us, too. He had to transport the body in that vehicle. He drove over by his residence, dumped the victim off in that field. So we needed the car. That was a valuable piece of evidence. Sergeant Cola decides to reach out to the psychic one more time. Hello, may I speak to Danielle, please? This is Sergeant Cola, Santa Clara County Sheriff. I Office. called Danielle back to inform her that she'd been exactly right on where we found a body. Maybe a believer. I told her we have one piece of critical evidence missing. It's the car. Donielle asks Cola to take her to the area where Norma's body had been found. So actually up by that big bush up there, mm -hmm. th that's where she was concealed. And right about so there, right in, here. right in there, right there. Yeah. She begins to concentrate her energies. I used remote viewing, which is when a person can look in their mind and see other places and accurately describe them. And I looked around. And I saw the car. And I told him to look in the underground garages. Oh, I said, wow. I thought, well, you know what? She gave me accurate information the first time. Why can't it be true for a second time? We need to get a hold of the transit patrol commander because those would be in his purview and in downtown Santa. So I got that information from Danielle. We pass this information along to our, all our patrol units to check different facilities in the city of San Jose. In a startling discovery, police find Norma's car in an underground garage, just as Donielle had predicted. The car reveals the critical evidence that they'd been looking for. So when we found the car, it did have the, uh, the blanket fibers in the car. It did have Norma's blood in the car. And it did have a lot of Bobby Biggs' fingerprints. This evidence is enough to indict Bobby Biggs for Norma Hofer's murder. And detectives can fill in some missing details about the crime. They find that after dumping Norma's body, Biggs drove to San Jose, where he planted her purse and her car in order to throw investigators off track. It didn't work. Thanks to the visions of a psychic, Investigators knew where to look for the body and who was responsible for putting it there. With so much evidence stacked against him, Biggs never made it to a trial. Ultimately, Bobby Biggs pled guilty to murder in the first degree and received a sentence of 25 years to life in prison. It was kind of creepy. I don't, I don't mean creepy in a bad way. Um, it kind of makes you more of a believer in the psychics. I think because of her, we solved it um, real quick instead of taking, you know, months or years. We all did it together. We all added our own little piece to the puzzle. Turns out that Danielle was a great investigative tool, like a fingerprint expert or a person analyzing clothing, fiber, whatever. She saw things in a different way, but, you know, it, it was just one piece of the puzzle that really helped bring it all together. So it was a job well done. Execution style killing and a deadly shootout. Small town America, big time crime in half an hour. First, a doctor found stabbed to death and a prime suspect with an unbreakable alibi. Medical detectives is next.